Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Frances. Uh, welcome to our webinar session on accommodation um, as part of our ongoing ANU application webinar series. Um, we will get started officially in a few moments. We're just going to let everyone get logged in um, and get connected. Um, <clears throat> if you do have any questions throughout the session, um, please put them into the Q&A section. Um, and we'll try and address as many of them as we possibly can towards the second half of the session today. Um, just give it a few more moments as people get connected. All right, the numbers are looking pretty stable, so we will get started. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Frances. I work with the Future Students team at the ANU. Uh, today's session is all about um, ANU accommodation. Uh, with me today, I have uh, Kathy and Katie, who will talk a bit about the application process and a bit about what it's actually like to live at ANU. Um, I will start this session by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and tune in from today um, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So throughout the session today, um, if you do have any questions, please put them into the Q&A section. Uh, we will try and address as many of them as we possibly can once we have finished the presentations, um, so more towards the second half of the session. Um, but to get started, I will share my screen and I will hand over to Kathy. Thanks, Francis. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining this afternoon. Um, I'm going to start and just talk through some of the application um, information that you would need to know and then hand over to Katie, who can give you some great information about actually living in a residence. So you might just pop to the next slide if we could. Thank you. All right, so I just wanted to firstly start to talk to you about making the application through the direct entry portal. Um, if you haven't already done so, um, there's just some things to think about. So I'd probably advise that before you get to the accommodation section um, in that application, you start to think about what residents would suit um, you while you're on campus um, and things like the room types, um, you know, the budget that you have. So a lot of things to consider. So you can go onto our website and we, we can talk further about that um, in a moment. And that lists all the different types of student accommodation. So please have a look at that and go through all of it. The tariffs we're currently showing are for 2022 and there will be an increase for 2023. Um, but that will give you um, some, you know, a ballpark figure to work with while you think about your budget. What I will say to you, and I'll mention it again through this, is that you will certainly get to choose a preference in your application, but please remember we can't guarantee preferences. We try very hard to and we'll do our best, um, but there may be an instance if we do not have the room at the residence you've asked for that we will offer you another residence. So that's what's important to get a good understanding of the different styles that we have here so that there's no surprises at the end. So um, we think about you've done your research, then you're going to log on to the ASA portal and do your application. When you get to the section for accommodation, you say that you do want to have accommodation and then you'll list um, just a few questions there. It will be a preference for your residence, will it be a drop down, you can make your choice then. Um, it'll be just some things like there is a question about if you have any medical um, or special needs, please do list that there. Even if you've already done so at the beginning of your application, please do list it again now. And all this information is treated in confidence and we would only use that information to make sure that we get the right placement for you. So if you do have um, any special medical needs, please don't think that it's going to go against you in any way. It's actually in your favour because we want to make sure that we get you into the right place. So make sure all the sections are completed and then you submit your application. But we do have, and the links are on the side and you'll be able to review these later. We have some good links about um, YouTube videos about living on campus. So I really um, encourage you to look at all those. So we might just pop to the next slide. We can, 
Thank you. So when we talked about the different living styles, I'll just go through um, what we do have on campus. So we have catered accommodation, which is three meals a day, seven days a week. So that's fully catered. And those areas are Bruce Hall, where Katie's from. We have Ursula Hall. Um, we have Bergman College and John's College. Um, they're affiliates. And we'll talk again a little further about that. We have flexi catered. So we have one flexi catered hall, which is right hall, and that's 16 meals per week in any combination that you like. Um, but just to say with the catering and flexi catering, it's, um, you know, it's not something you can accumulate. So any meals in your package that is taken that week, you can't sort of like, you know, gather them up and have a big hit, you know, um, in a couple of days, you have to use it as it is. And then we have self catered residents. So our self catered a Burton and Garen Hall, Fenner Hall, Woomburn Hall, and we've got our four lodges, Davy Kinlock, Lena Carmel, and Warrnambool. So we also have a mix. Now, the postgraduate areas don't mean anything to you at the moment, but just so we know, we have a really good mix of undergrad and postgrad areas and some residents that are just, that are not listed here, just for postgraduates. Um, so it, within our residence, the living style varies slightly. So we have somewhere like all our catered halls and our flexi catered halls and some of our self catered halls, you're going to have your own single lockable room, but you'll be sharing unisex bathrooms and then either dining room for your meals or big kitchens on the ground floor. But then we also, in our lodges, our four lodges that we talked about, Davy, Kinlock, Lena Carmel and Warrnambool, they have self-contained studios um, or multi-share apartments. So a little bit more uh, like a, a more modern style of, you know, apartment living. Now, the single studios are there. So if, if for some reason you would prefer your own self-contained area, your own bathroom, your own kitchenette, then that's obviously something to look at. And that can be a good option for someone that maybe, you know, for medical, cultural reasons, you prefer your own private facilities. So that's an option for you. Um, so, you know, you can see that it's quite different even between the self-catered residents. So think about that as well when you're doing it. Um, but as I said, everyone's got their own lockable room, however you live. So you're not going to be sharing your room with anyone, but do realise about unisex bathrooms as well. So you might just go on to the next slide if we can. Okay, so this is the sort of more what I think is really important to think about. Obviously, applications, direct entry applications have already been opened, um, but they will close on the 23rd of May. So you've lodged your application um, through the direct entry pathway and you've selected accommodation. So what we say, your early offer, so this is an offer that will, you know, will come out in September, on the 5th of September, and the deadline to accept that will be the 5th of October. Now, for accommodation, at this time, there'll be no contracts for you to sign and you will not pay anything at this stage. So the early offers are released and they're basically just, you know, confirming you do want a place on campus and we'll say where it is. So, for instance, you know, Katie's made an application through the direct entry on the 5th that comes out. It will tell her her academic um, offer. It will say, you know, you've been offered a place at, and it could be Bruce Hall. It's not going to give you a room number or anything at this stage. It's That's the part that will confirm the residence that you'll be going to, okay? So just look out for that. And then obviously your scholarship offer, if that's applicable to you. One thing I will sort of stress here and at this stage and again at the end, it's really important that you remember when your offer is released that you accept all components of the offer in the direct entry portal. By just confirming your academic offer, it doesn't flow through to the other section. So, you know, don't think I'll oh, click that, it's all done. Make sure you respond to each area, your academic, your accommodation and scholarship again if it's applicable. Um, you know, when you do that through the direct entry portal, that will come through into our accommodation system and we'll see that you've already been, you know, you've actioned that, but we'll be in touch with you through the process as well, um, just to encourage you to do that by the deadline. Now, your final confirmed offer will be released either on the 22nd of December or the 9th of January. Now, we do have an asterisk there, TBA, that's the dates at the moment, but I always encourage you to keep you know yourself informed via the website 
or further um, you know, webinars in case any of those dates do change later in the year, but that's what we'd be aiming for at this stage. Now that's when, when we say you're confirmed, that's when your ATAR has been you know, released and confirmed. And again, that offer will then confirm your final academic place, your accommodation and your scholarship. This is the part again, where you respond to each section of it. When you respond in the direct entry portal to that, it will update our system and that's when we will send you out the formal contract that you will need to sign electronically and the fees that you need to pay. So that's the part where you're locking into an occupancy agreement and paying fees. Now, as I said, that will come out electronically. So you just need to read that information and follow the instructions. It's pretty straightforward, but I will say to you, um, and you'll have the opportunity to do that in the offer, when you go ahead and accept a contract, you are accepting a legal binding agreement. So please do read that carefully because once you accept and pay fees, you've accepted that um, responsibility of paying for your contract from the start date right up to the end date. Okay, so please be mindful of that because it's not a case of just accepting and then think I won't do it. They, they, you know, there is going to be consequences if you pull out of an of accepted contract. So please make sure you read all that um, and also reach out to us if you need anything explained to you further. Again, at this stage, the deadline to accept and pay your fees will be the 24th of January. So it has to be done by then if you have at that time and we'll have further webinars later on in the year. But if you do have any, um, you know, you need help for anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, to the future students or to us directly if it, if it involves accommodation. Um, so they're the important things, the dates, knowing that at the first stage in September, there will be no contract and nothing to pay, okay? We, we're confirming a spot for you. As I said, when the final offer is released, that's going to tell you exactly where you're going um, and, you know, like, you, you know, it's a single studio at Davy Lodge um, or you're going to Bruce Hall or you're going to Fenner Hall, that's where it'll outline more information. So that's something to keep your eye out for. Um, as I said, again, tariffs for 2023 have not been released, um, but the tariffs that are showing currently that you can look on our website um, are going to give you a very good, you know, indication of what you can budget for. The fees that you will pay when you receive your um, contract at the end of the year, they will vary obviously to where you go. But to give you an idea, it's going to consist of a refundable deposit. And currently that's $1,000. It will be um, a resident committee fee. That will be a registration fee. And it'll be two weeks rent in advance based on the location you're going to be living. So this is just a ballpark figure. You could be looking around, say, $2,500. And what will happen, you'll pay that. It will go onto your account. And when you move into the residence, you'll be asked to um, submit Australian banking details. And then your rent will be just taken um, by direct debit on a fortnightly basis. So that's pretty straightforward. You are welcome to pay up front for a full semester or a full year. But most people prefer the direct debit fortnightly option. Um, but that's you know something you can decide closer to the time. So we might just pop up to the next slide, if we can. Thank you. Okay. This is something I would like to talk to you about, um, and I think it's important. It's about accommodation preferences. Now, I touched on it before to say to you that you can certainly select a preference. We will try very hard to meet that for you, but we can't always do that. Um, our residents have a mixture of returning and new students, so we have to have a really good balance in the residents with that. So we will have um, returning students, we will look at the places we have available for new students coming in, and also we'll balance um, as much as we can, and Katie might touch on this shortly, is in each residence we really try and aim for a balance of male, female, domestic, international students, etc. So selection is never personal. If you're not, if you don't receive your preference, it's nothing personal at all. It's just that we may not have the place for you there. So what we would do is we would look at the lifestyle that you've chosen. So if it was say self-catered, we'd look for our next self-catered vacancy we had to offer you. And we would offer that in, in your offer letter. Uh, again, catered, we would look for another catering option if possible. If there was no catering, you'll be offered self-catered. So just as I said right in the beginning, do some research and make yourself familiar for all styles of living. So you just know, um, you know what could be coming. 
what will happen. So when you get your early offer released, and at that time, um, if you were told that it was somewhere that you weren't hoping, you know, that it wasn't your first preference and you wanted to change, or maybe you've put in a preference and then had a think about it since and thought, no, I'd like to change that. So we will open what we call a preference change request form, and that will open on the 10th of October and it will close on the 18th of November. Now, once you accept the early offer, and I'll come back to that, we will send out that information to you. So you don't have to go looking for it yet. It's not going to be anywhere yet. We will open up the form and we'll send the link out to you via email, and then you can access that if you choose to do so. What you will have to understand, though, when your early offer is released on the 5th of September, you must accept that offer first before you can apply to change your preference, okay? So we can't have you email and say, well, I've got this, but can you change it now? We can't. I would suggest that you accept the offer you're given because, remember, you're not paying anything and you're not signing a contract. So you just, you, you know, you're saying, I've got somewhere on campus, once you accept, then you would get the information to apply to change your request. And we would look at that then. The reason being, we would still be going through returner processes, transfer processes internally, and that will then give us a better understanding of what movement we can make. Okay, so accept your offer and then apply for a preference. Um, if you're either way, successful or unsuccessful, we will notify you via email on the 5th of December. And that will say, you know, um, hi, Katie, your preference change has been successful. You will now be going to X or we're not successful. Um, but if you're not, your original allocation will still be in place. You won't lose that original offer. That's why I strongly encourage you to accept the first early offer regardless. Okay, that will get you a place on campus. And again, even if you're not successful at this stage, we do, once you're on campus though and living in res, we do have processes into residential transfers that open up twice a year and it gives people the option, if they still want to at that stage, um, option to move around um, for the following semester. So there are a few things. So, you know, again, I'll just stress, when the offer comes out, accept the offer you're given, the early offer then apply for a preference change, be notified, and your final offer will reflect either your original selection or the new application. You won't have to do anything else, okay? Some people say, well, if I don't get it, what if I just don't accept this and I apply directly for accommodation? You're very welcome to do that. Um, if you decline this in the direct entry portal, you certainly can still apply through the accommodation services portal. But please remember these few things. You would not receive your accommodation offer and that it would not come out to you that pathway until early January, whereas this you sort of already know where you're going to go. We would also then, because the direct entry applicants are getting a very early offer, that would probably consume a lot of beds anyway. So by leaving it thinking I'll wait and just do it directly, you know, through our portal and I won't take this offer, that won't give you any extra chance of getting what you want. It could potentially reduce it a little bit. So my advice would be accept, request a change and go from there. But we will certainly try what we can with the preferences anyway. We always do. So that's my sort of my bit of a nana nag on that one, just so that you know. Um, but I really think it's important to understand that. But again, you know, you can email us directly or future students if, if any of that, you know, needs more explanation for you. So we might pop to the next slide. And this is where I'm going to now hand over to Katie, um, who, as I said, is the head of Bruce Hall. And she's now going to give you much less, um, you know, admin talk that I just had to, you had to sit through and she will tell you a lot about living on campus. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Cathy. So I'll start by um, <clears throat> also saying that this information applies to all of the residences. Um, we have, you know, despite the varying styles or lifestyles around catered, self-catered, flexi-catered, uh, we all offer very similar programming um, and the buildings uh, as well in terms of common areas and how the bedrooms are equipped are of, of similar styles. 
as well. So within uh, the buildings, you can find, um, you know, computer rooms. A lot of students these days do bring their own laptops and other IT um, equipment. Some of the resident, all the residents are equipped with Wi-Fi that the university give you access to. Um, and uh, some of the residences have got um, the LAN cable access. Um, most of us have got computer rooms and that are hooked up to the university printers uh, um, and hooked up to the university network. So people who might be into gaming will often get together in various spaces to, um, to do that if they're not doing it in their rooms. Um, the computer rooms are also a great spot for centralised study. And it's also a great spot for that's just out of your room. So we do encourage people to take, you know, to use the shared study spaces as an alternate study space just to get a bit of a um, you know, different environment and to help with that motivation side of it for the, for the academic study. Um, all of the, the residences have got great common areas, usually equipped with TVs or there might be a little kitchenette uh, where you can um, make a cuppa, have some snacks. Uh, a lot of people will, you know, share Netflix and Stan and various code so that people have a lot of group movie nights. Um, I think maths is quite common at the moment for a number of, in a number of our common rooms, at least at Bruce Hall. Um, yeah, we've all got uh, areas for ping pong and pool tables. Um, there's some great you know, rooftop gardens at Lena Carmel that's very established um, and very productive in terms of their, their fruit and veg yield um, and the Bruce and Wright ones are coming along having um, been about for, there for about four years now. Um, there's, you know, as Cathy mentioned, um, we've got accessible rooms. So don't let um, your you know, disability um, or if you've got any additional needs be, um, you know, don't let that sway you. Just let us know and we you know, do our best to accommodate um, everyone. Uh, some of the residences have got gyms. Those that don't have uh, gyms, there are two centralised gyms. One is, is run by our ANU sport people and the other is a Club Lime membership. Um, and a lot of us for any music students slash people coming who are just going to do music as an as a extracurricular activity um, have got music rooms and art rooms as well. Uh, and so take it for Bruce and Wright. Um, we've got quite a few music rooms and a, and a grand piano, a number of students from Wright Hall will often come over and use the pianos to practice over here, particularly our music students. Um, so the other thing that um, I guess one of the, the benefits um, of living on campus is the location. You know, the accommodation is um, dotted around the campus, but all quite central and within a you know, eight minute walk to the central areas of the university. Um, we've got these e-scooters now in Canberra and a lot of the students are um, choosing to ride those to and from class, even though it's a, a seven minute walk. We do strongly recommend bringing a bike. And if you don't know how to ride a bike, there are plenty of people within the residence that can help show you. We do um, offer that, um, you know, if people need to learn uh, when, when they arrive during the orientation week period. Um, it also is great for access to public transport um, in terms of you know, getting to and from work um, to support the living and I guess socialising costs that are associated with relocating from home. Um, I think the, the costs, um, the facilities, it's all uh, inclusive in the, in the tariff. So that's your electricity, your water, heating, internet, um, use of the spaces. Um, and we've got uh, inbuilt pastoral care set up. So some of that is peer-to-peer -peer, where we've trained up uh, second and third year students in mentoring, be that for you know, pastoral support or academic support. And then there are, of course, the ANU staff members such as myself and our, our wellbeing coordinator or a deputy head who um, can also help with um, pastoral care support and you know, referrals if need be to various um, outside supports, depending on the level of need. Uh, and also for academic support, so students will often come if they're having um, some trouble with, um, you know, just adjusting to the academic needs of university or trying to figure out, you know, various referencing, because each academic college does have 
you know, some slightly different referencing requirements. Um, we can also help with time management skills and um, some budgeting uh, skills if people get a bit waylaid there. Um, we have got um, each building um, has got inbuilt, you know, security access with swipe card access. So only members or residents of that hall can uh, access that building and each individual bedroom has got its own individual unique code. So um, uh, the buildings are quite secure. A lot of the buildings have now got CCTV um, cameras in there uh, and we will often refer to those if you know, someone might report a bike being stolen or if we need to um, uh, chase up some, some damage that has occurred. But the students have, have reported feeling a lot safer since um, that has been uh, put in on campus. Um, we have got, so I think the, um, of course you, you know, you're living with 300 to 400 other people. So you've got surrounded by um, a number of uh, like-minded people. Uh, however, we do try and build a very diverse community when um, selecting applicants. So Kathy mentioned that we look uh, at um, genders, we look at discipline studies um, in order to create a diverse community. And on top of that, we also look at balancing our returners as, as well through that process. And then um, we go down the next level once students are allocated to our residences, we try and spread people out and create a, you know, help create diversity within the floors. So there we're looking at um, you know, where people are from, what their interests are, what they might be studying as well. The information that, that you've included in your applications there that can help us really build a community that's gonna thrive um, and benefit from being around each other. Uh, so I think that sense of community is one of the biggest um, uh, benefits of living on campus and certainly something that we as staff will work towards building and creating um, for everybody. Um, you know, you can, whilst you might be living with 450 people, we, we will help people facilitate new friendships, but it's not always easy reaching out, particularly after you might have been at a school for two, six or, or even 12 years in some cases that um, to start off to build new networks and new friendships can be challenging. And that's what our P2P mentors are in place for. Each of the residences have got um, those P2P mentors on each of the floors and they um, have usually been in residences for two years, if not a bit longer. And so have got a fair bit of experience in communal living uh, under their belt and also know their way around the university and are full of all the handy tips and tricks um, that we find our, our first years and new people new to the university need to know. Um, uh, so the other side of it is obviously the social and sort of sporting side that we uh, promote. There's a, a couple of interhall um, sporting and arts competitions that the residents participate in. They, um, there are about four of those each term um, and uh, everyone is free to participate um, in those. So that ranges from you know, hockey, football, soccer, tennis, swimming and the art side, debating, theatre, um, choir. There's a, a big band competition. Um, there's a literacy um, like writing and art competition as well. Um, and then the, the other side of uh, um, that is the social side where we might um, have themed uh, days or themed evenings for various um, uh, days. There are also, you know, pot plant planting things. Our residents recently did a a bead making and flower pressing day, which was, you know, quite had quite a significant turnout by by everyone, which was great to see. And it was something new that our team had thought of and, and implemented. Um, we've just finished with the mid-semester exams. So a lot of the halls are doing you know, kind of stress less um, festivals where they might bring in um, some dogs for the day, or there might be cupcakes, or they might want to do warm cookies. Um, so things that can kind of that you might be might have had at home, but you might find it a bit harder to get access to um, uh, now you're away from home. We will try and um, come up with some 
some varying ideas to help promote that sense of, of community and support uh, that we can provide for, for you all. Um, sorry, next slide, please. Um, so I think I have covered a lot of what is, is on that slide already, sorry. Um, next slide. Um, so here we, again, this um, kind of shows you what, um, how residences are made up and also goes, goes in to show how we, uh, once we get students allocated to us, go into to, um, ensuring that we mix people up on the, the floors to try and create a balanced community from um, either over the world or uh, domestically as well. Um, and next slide, please. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Kathy. I think this is, I'm just going to jump in now. Thank you for that. Um, so just a few things, again, to get you to think about. We've got the link there for the 3D images of our residents, and you can go to our webpage and see that now. And there's, um, you know, the, the YouTube videos, which are really good to watch, like living in a catered residence, living in self-catered, living in the lodges. They're I think they're I, I think they're a really good thing to look at because you actually see real people that live there telling you this information. So it's, um, I think it's a great source to look at. Yeah. And they are a great um, reflection of, they yeah, do accurately reflect what the residences look like. Yeah, it does. It's sort of, and it's it's good because it really it goes into rooms and, you know, it's not all polished. It's really nice. It's, you know, it's authentic. And I think it does. It's like Katie said, it, it does give you a, a realistic understanding. Um, there are some other webinars um, which aren't actually accommodated related, but the things that you should still have a look on that webinar series. Um, but we would be coming back on the 18th of May um, for the final, any final questions that you may have. Um, I think that will be from other areas as well, from scholarships and admissions as well, but we will join that at that time. Open day at ANU um, has been marked for the 3rd of September. Um, I believe at this stage, again, that's probably going to be maybe a hybrid model where there'll be some online and some, you know, in person. But of course, we'll just see what COVID gets up to because um, it squashed our plans, you know, day before last year. So, but there'll be something there if, if it goes ahead and it's in person, I encourage you to come down and have a look at the campus. Um, just to get a feel of it, it's a, a you know lovely campus and it's very well situated. So it's definitely something to come along and, and look at if you are able to. Um, so we might just pop to the next slide, which is just going to give you our contact details. So there's our email there, uni.com at anu.edu.au. Um, you know, please reach out if you've got any questions around this. Um, we've got our website there and, of course, Facebook and Instagram. So I encourage you to, you know, to follow those as well. I think that's sort of really about it. And it's probably good if we can jump into your questions now um, that, you know, might be able to clear up any of those things that you have. So I'll pass that over to Francis, who might be able to let us know. Absolutely. Um, we will jump straight into questions. I will remind Everyone, if you do have any questions, please put them into the Q&A, but we've got a few sitting here waiting for us. Um, really great question that always comes up. Do, is, is there an option to defer your accommodation offer or what do you do if you're going to defer? Yeah, good. That's a good question. When it comes out, you would you know defer your academic offer. You would decline your accommodation offer. We don't defer them as such. So if we'd offered you a place, say, at Fenner Hall, um, we're not going to hold that spot for the following year. What you would need to do is to just decline the accommodation. When you do start your academic program at ANU, you would apply directly through our accommodation services portal. Um, you're still under the guarantee because you haven't started at ANU and same process you'd fill it out one preference etc and then be made an offer from there we would know deferred students that were coming through so yes you would decline it it's still under the guarantee but it would come out in the period that you're going to start so if you were coming in 2024 you just look for the application dates late 2023 for that process for us yeah there's a couple of questions here I'm sure um Kathy, you covered this, but we'll just make sure that it's clear. 
if you've already submitted your ANU application, is there an opportunity to change your accommodation preference between now and when the offers come out? No. So as I said, we can't do anything now. And the reason is that we're working over a couple of systems here. So the information is being gathered in the direct entry portal. Um, and that's all going to be gathered there. And it won't be till it closes and work is done in the background that it's pushed into our accommodation system. So while we know who's there looking through our reports, we're not going to see that visually yet. And no, we can't. But as I said, um, we will look through all the things after they're submitted. Um, we will make you the offer we're going to make you in that early round and after you accept. So stress again, you must accept that offer first and then you'll get the information about the preference change request form, okay? You're not paying anything. You're not accepting anything at the early round. So it, it's just in your favour to accept whatever you're given and then go through that preference change. Great. Um, there's a question here about the tariffs. So when tariffs say they start from... Yep. Amount. Um, how much more than that would would someone potentially have to pay? Yeah, um, we say from because some of the areas and mo and this reflects basically our four lodges because they have that more apartment style of living with the multi share apartments, which are anywhere from a two to six bedroom multi share. We're going from the base rate, which might be you know a six bedroom multi share, and they certainly can go up. So. For instance, in the lodges, if you went into a multi-share, it could certainly be somewhere in the vicinity of, say, 270 a week, but it could go up to somewhere like, you know, 380 if you wanted a single studio. So there is a range. When we say from, say, at Fenham Hall, B&G, Bruce, um, they are standard rooms. So it would be basically the tariff that you're seeing for those areas would be the tariff. But we, yeah, as I said, the lodges, we have to sort of say from there's too many room styles to put all the costings. Um, but you would definitely see your offer when you get your formal offer at the end of the year that will tell you the style and the you know the rate etc great um there's a question i guess that's sort of general but also for accommodation are there any virtual open days for interstate students um certainly a new open day as we we said will be a hybrid of some online components and some in-person components um, Catherine, is there any specific accommodation things that will happen online that we know about yet, or is it still a bit sort of planning stage? Yeah, it's still a little bit early yet. Um, and, the, and of course, you know, as we all know, with the world changing as it does with COVID, things can change. But I believe, I mean, historically, we used to do tours into the residence, and I don't know if that will be possible again this year, even if it's on campus um, open day, um, you know, be chances to, you know, probably visit in some way, maybe activities outside so you can see the buildings. But I would encourage you, I know it's not the same as physically going in somewhere. Do have a look at the videos we talked about, look at the 3D images. Um, but it's very difficult. Um, people just say, I'm coming to Canberra, can I come and have a, a tour? It's hard because A, these are people's homes. So we can't just have people coming in, you know, wandering around, as you'd understand, because it's people's homes and, you know, there's things going on for them. Um, and also, too, we staff have got to be available to take people around. So it is difficult. Um, Let's see what happens open day. Um, we can do that. But, yeah, definitely go back to the videos because I think Katie's right. The, the ones we talked about with YouTube, that gives you a pretty good feel of what it looks like. Yeah. Um, here's a question, actually, Katie, that you, you're probably perfectly placed to answer. Um, I've heard that each hall and college has its own distinct vibe. Is this true? I guess by the nature of, um, you know, catered, Flex catered, self catered. There are, you know, slightly slight variances within the residences, um, and you know that attracts people with different interests as as well. And so we recommend if you can get down to open day to have a look, have a chat with the residents, have a chat with us. You do certainly get a sense for um, the place, and the three D tours also give you a sense of the buildings as well, which can um, which does also contribute to to the cultures and uniqueness of each of the halls. Mm. Kathy, do you have anything to add there? I probably, I think it's just that, and I think it's great. I think it shows the passion. If you talk to people, everyone will say my residence is the best. And I think that that's a good thing because it is, everyone's passionate about where they live. 
Um, what I will say, and probably no one will believe me when I say it, but it, it's true after all these years I've figured it out. Often someone, even if they go somewhere they hadn't first wanted, but you know, potentially, and people say, well, once I get there, I'm going to apply for an inter-residential transfer. We find that when that happens, we have hardly anyone that then wants to transfer. Because when you move in, and you find that place and you meet friends, it becomes your home within a, a couple of weeks and no one really wants to go from there. I suppose you can come, you know, family or friends might tell you about a place and you sort of get attachment to it prior to coming. Keep an open mind. They are all fantastic. Katie's right. There's variances because of, of the living styles, but they are all there. There's so much um opportunity to mix they're close by you can go visit someone friends that live in the other residence so it's not that you're going to be completely separate in that way um so yeah i i just think it's not you know it's just the passion that people will tell you always it's the best one and of course each one is the best one um so the next question here i might just address so is there an opportunity to come and look around the university in particular the accommodation prior to early entry closing. Now we do have some um, campus tours running during the April school holidays um, starting from next Monday. They are, you do have to book in for them um, and I do know they have already been quite popular but hopefully there are still some spots available. Um, I will stress general campus tour. Um, we are still dealing with COVID safety and so restrictions on campus. Um, we've already said because these residences are people's homes, you wouldn't be able to go and have a look through them, but you would certainly get a sense of where they are on campus, how they relate to, you know, how far is it going to be to walk or ride to class, um, that kind of thing. So I do um, encourage you, if you do have an opportunity to come to Canberra and to take one of those campus tours, it is still very valuable. Um, we just really can't have people wandering through accommodation just yet. Um, we will strive to do that when things are safe enough uh, but yeah definitely still come to campus and have a look around Kathy did you have anything to add to that no I agree um you know we're sorry that you can't that, that, that you know the world has changed and um, we just have to respect the people that live there um, for their safety your safety um yeah, and just have that. But you can definitely get a sense. Yeah, the campus, as I said, I think if you see it, you can see outside the buildings. That's not the same as going in potentially, but you you can still see, as you said, where they're located, um, how things are so, you know, they're all sort of connected by Cambria that's right in the centre with lots of eating places and a little supermarket and, you know, bank. And, you know, it's so, it's like a little little village in itself so definitely come and have a look that that gives you a feel of where it all sits um yeah and if things change down the track and we can take you in we will but that's just not possible at this time um there's a question here actually very specific to right hall so since right hall is flexicated are there kitchen facilities to cook your own meals when needed yeah, so they have a pavilion where there is an oven um, and a little cooktop, I believe. Um, however, what we have found is that a lot of students aren't using that. The benefit of, of the Flexicated at Wright Hall is that there are 16 meals um, and most students are only acc accessing two meals a day. So a lot of people either don't bother coming back for lunch um, because they have a big breakfast or, um, you know, we find that a lot of people in catered halls don't you know, breakfast is very uh, unattended. Um, so, yeah, there has not been. But, yes, there is a space for people to prepare a meal in, in Wright Hall if they want. Um, however, when my, when my students arrive, we find that it is not, it's underutilised. Yeah. Um, and one thing we can just say, regardless, self-catered, catered, there is no cooking. Unless you have a single studio, your own private facilities, there's no cooking of any kind in your room. So, you know, when before you come, your residents will be able to tell you like a bit of a checklist or suggestions to bring, but yeah, don't turn up with appliances and things like that because you're not allowed to have them, obviously, for safety reasons in your room. Always check before you take anything in or, you know, um, buy anything like that. But in the halls, there are like separate areas. Yeah, like zip hot water heaters. You can make a cup of tea and, you know, go to your room, but you can't sort of have a bit of a cook up in there. So just bear that in mind as well. Great. Um, while we're talking meals, 
Um, there's a question about, can you go and have meals at another residence's dining hall? Yeah, um, so yeah, we do allow people to buy a meal ticket um, if they're accompanied by a guest. Yet yeah, there's not that um, real sharing side of um, people from other residences coming into a dining hall. There is new accommodation uh, being built, which is, is going to um, have more of that model applied. However, um, at the moment, um, it is encouraged that you have a, that you're attending um, a catered hall with a friend. Yeah. Because, yeah, and to sort of clarify, if we we're saying that you got offered self-catered and then decided you wanted catered and we had no catered, you can't take self-catered, then go to over to Bruce and, and buy 21 meals. It's only like if you're going with your friend for a visit, you could have a meal, but you can't go and access that, you know, because you've, you know, obviously catering's got to be worked around set numbers, um, not just, you know, it's not like a restaurant where anyone can just come in, they're catering for a certain number of people. But there are things, you know, for people going into self-catered, if you're concerned about that anyway, there are, you know, food deliveries, Coles, Woolies, all that deliver. You can get groceries delivered. As I said, um, we're right in the city, so there's supermarkets. Mm. Um, there's all the, you know, people sometimes use things like Gym Meals Direct or, you know, light and easy deliveries. Um, even some people that like cooking, but maybe at really busy times think, you know, I'll just get this in through, you know, exam times or something if I don't want to cook. Um, and right on campus. And as I said, in Canberra, we've got lots of little eating places there. Um, you know, they do, you know, lunch boxes for maybe like, you know, $10 with, you know, two dishes and rice. I can totally recommend the honey chicken that was downstairs from our office and I've eaten it many times. Um, so there's things like that. It's easy to access food. So that's, you know, not, not something you should be concerned about because it's very um, easily to obtain. Yeah. And during the orientation week for anyone that is does get allocated self-catered or even if you choose self-catered and you don't know how to cook, that's okay because there are lots of teams there that will teach you the basics. So they have a number of um, cooking classes to, to teach you the basics and um, the peer-to-peer -peer mentoring side of things there. They also show you how to score the cheap eats when, it, when Woolies and Coles mark down their meat and veg and various other products. They are very good at knowing all of that. Some of them have got arrangements with um, various bakeries and get bread deliveries as well. So there are people that can help you to learn how to cook. And uh, most people form little cooking groups so that you know if you are really busy, then you know that on Monday night, it's, you're not gonna have to cook because someone else will be. So, yeah. Great. Um, there's a question here. Uh, about laundry. So how, how did laundries work um, and what sort of extra costs are involved? Yep. So there are two uh, ways that laundries are working at the moment on campus. One is for some of the older residences, it's included in the tariffs. And then for the newer residences, it is um, pay as you use. So the equivalent cost is, is roughly $6 a week. So in the pay as you go, it is um, tap with your credit card and it's $3 a wash, $3 a dry. Um, yeah, some of the residences have got clothes lines. Other residences have got balconies where the students will put um, a little clothes horse out if they want to air dry their things. Um, yep, yeah, so that's how the laundries work. Awesome. Um, there's a question here about, uh, do you have to vacate your accommodation between semesters one and two, or can you remain on campus during that time? So your contract, you'll be given a full year contract. Um, so as I talked about before, it is a, a, you know, a binding occupancy agreement. So again, please read it carefully when you get your offer before you accept. For the full year contract, you're contracted for that full period. You don't have to move. That's your room for the period that you've accepted on. So if you go on holidays, you're, that's your room. You lock it and go, but you're still paying. So you would not be asked to move. At the end of your contract, um, as it gets closer, your residents would come out to you and do a couple of things. Firstly, it would be like, would you like to be considered to return for the following year? Would you like to apply to transfer to another residence for the following year? So that process would work first. 
um, and you'd either be invited back for the following contract or transfer to your new area. And the second part would be, would you like summer accommodation? So at the end of your contract, that's when you would pack up your room completely and you would vacate. Even if you're going back, so if you're living at Katie's Bruce Hall, um, you'd finished your contract, you'd be invited back to Bruce for the following year, you'd still pack up and leave. Um, because you might have to change a room for next year. Maybe not, but you, you might have to. So you can't leave your things there. Um, and then you go. But if you can't go home or you're working, you'd be offered summer accommodation. Now, that, that may not be at the hall that you're going to be living at for the following year because we close some halls down for maintenance and it's just some that are opened. But you'd be given the opportunity to stay somewhere else if you needed to. Um, the people that are on one semester contracts, that's only for people that um, exchange students or they're graduating at the end of the semester. Um, and they would, of course, pack up and, and go. So, no, you won't have to leave. It'll be just at the end of the contract that you have to um, clean your room out and take your things with you. Great. Um, there's a question here. So how does the process... Um, um, thinking they're probably referring to the application process, differ for the partnered colleges, so for Johns and for Bergman? So through the direct entry, nothing. You still select them. Now, they often require supplementary information. That's not something our residents ask for. Um, and if they come out to you once, so once you select them, if in the application they ask for anything else to fill out, you would just go and fill that out to them. Um, or once your application is submitted and this is closed, what will happen is then once it's all done, we will send them all the applications that have selected them. So everything will go to Bergman, everything will go to Johns. They will make their choices and to say, we can offer this person, we can't offer that person. And if they, um, they'll let us know. If they can't offer you, as I said, we'll offer you the next vacancy that we have. So that's what will happen if they hand your application back because they don't have um, a spot for you. But even after that, when it closes, if they that we give them your details and they reach out to you, they may reach out and ask you to fill out extra form or a telephone interview. I don't know. It doesn't happen all the time. So please don't be concerned if you apply for them and then don't hear um, you know, because maybe they just, they don't need it. I don't know. Um, but you can always follow up with them directly as well. But it still comes through our pathway. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's only one more question sitting around here. Um, I think we, we, we certainly covered this a bit earlier, but Kathy, just to reiterate, we've got tariffs online at the moment that are for this year um, and then for next year. Um, people should just be aware that they they may go well. They're likely to go up. Yes. Yes. Um, I could. Yeah. I, I can't see a situation where they won't. To be honest, just like anything in life, everything is going to have a slight increase. To what it is, I don't know. Um, we always hope that we have our tariffs ready for publishing by open day. So that would lead us to hope that we could see something by August thereabouts. Um, so when your offer is released, I'm hoping your early offer that you'll be able to review the tariffs um, for 2023 online to see what they are. Um, if not, it would be not long after. And as I said, remember, it's not to your final offer that you have to make your informed decision about whether you're going to accept the accommodation or not. So you'll, you'll have definitely get that opportunity to see what those tariffs are. Probably touching too that contract lengths vary slightly in residence. Um, currently this year, we have um, 44 weeks, we have um, 48 weeks and we have 51 weeks. So they do end at different times. Um, somewhere like our lodges, they're going to end on the 1st of February. So you have to be mindful of that. Now, contract lengths may change a little bit for next year, but again, that's something that will be notified as we go along. Um, and that, that wouldn't be any more. It may be slightly less, but it, it just, you know, sort of work on what we've talked about at the moment. So remembering that when you accept an occupancy agreement, you're paying from the start of the contract, regardless if you decide to come a couple of days later, um, and you're paying to the end of the contract. So even if you decide you're going home early, you finish what you want to do and you want to head off home, you still will be paying. I can't stress that enough, okay? They're not, they're not negotiable in that sense. Um, 
So just make yourself very aware when you accept anything, um, any type of document, you should always read it to know what you're, you know, agreeing to in that way. Great. Um, there is one last question here. Um, so this, I think, speaks to the, what we were talking about with Johns and Bergman. So if you've, if you no longer want to go to Johns or Bergman, um, you're planning to apply for a change when that change of preference request comes out. Do they need to fill in the supplementary forms or all of the other the things that John Zelbergman may want? Look, I, I, I'll say these two things to you. I, I would do it anyway. If you've, if you've selected them or you've done that, I, I would still do it. Just finish your process. Put your application in for your preference change form um, because the thing is probably this. If you think, I don't want to go there now and I'm not going to fill in the forms, but then when the offers are released, we give them your names. They might go, well, look, they didn't, they didn't want to follow any process. They obviously, you know, they mustn't want to come here. We won't be able to take that application. So I would still do it because if for some reason you change your mind, again, it's too late. Do you know what I mean? You haven't done the forms when they've asked for it and it's too late to change your mind back again um, or for them to request it. Just fill it in. If you know, unless you really, really don't want to, but just fill it in so you've covered all your bases just in case you have a you know a change of mind again later because you never know, right? Absolutely. Um, so we are getting very close to our time for this afternoon. There is one more question, should be very quick. Is there parking available on site for students who live on campus? Oh, I'm not going near the parking. I'll let Katie answer this. <laughs> So there is parking, however, it is incredibly limited and we strongly discourage bringing a car. We say get your, your folks to drop you down here if you can or come down with a friend. Um, there is, yeah, it's incredibly limited and that's it's only getting less. Um, so we do, you know, Canberra is a very bike friendly uh, city and now with these e-scooters as, as well, um, they're improving the bike paths all the time. So we recommend a lot of people get around on bikes. Um, get to work um, uh, and to class with a bike. Um, and the paths leading to accommodation are very well lit. There's also, um, so if you are returning from work late at night um, or in winter when it gets dark quite early, there are very well lit paths and there's security escorts available as well. So we do strongly discourage bringing cars because there is just very limited parking. Yeah. It's hard for for all of us that if working on campus, it's, you know, parking's just not straightforward. So, yeah. I, I agree with the parking thing. I catch public transport, um, which is also really great in Canberra. You've got access to light rail, lots of buses. Um, you just get a transport Canberra, my, um, my pass or whatever it's called. I can't remember right now, but you get a card and you tap on and off and it's rather easy to get around um, the city. Um, that pretty much brings us to the end of our time. Um, I think we can probably finish just by addressing this one last question that's come in because um, it does sum up um, what we've been talking about with preferences and things. So, Kathy, because people can only put in one preference, if they prefer, say, a self-catered accommodation and they don't get their, their preference, what then happens? What are they likely to get? Well, they get another self-catered. So um, it wouldn't be the... What the thing that can happen is, um, and we, as I said, we'll try not to, but it, there's, there's always a, an op, you know, chance this can happen. You, anyone that goes for catering, if we couldn't do catering, we'll look for the next catered or the next flexi catered. But if there was no catering available, no rooms left, you will be offered self catered. But if you take self catered and that particular resident, say like Fennahor, we couldn't put you there, we wouldn't offer you catered. It doesn't go the reverse way. So we would look for another self-catered. So we'd look at B&G, we'd look at Wormbrook, we'd look at one of the lodges. So that's how it works, but we'd never flip it the other way and offer you catered because why someone that wants catered obviously does want that, they can still live in self-catered, but we'd realise that someone that particularly asked for self-catered could have reasons why they can't, you know, have meals. Could be, you know, dietary, you know, costings, all that. So we would never go the reverse way. So to say what it is, we don't know until we start looking at allocations. But as I said, for all direct entry applicants, um, we've tried very hard to always try and meet the preferences as best we can. 
but you know sometimes it doesn't happen great all right um so that does bring us to time thank you everyone for joining us um apologies if we haven't been able to answer your questions but hopefully you've gotten plenty of useful information this afternoon if you do have any further questions um, the recording for this session will be up online um, in the next couple of days. Um, please get in touch with the university, with the accommodation team or with our um, future student inquiry team if you do have any questions. Um, I will remind you to book in for those campus tours if you have a chance to come and look at the campus over the April school holidays. Otherwise, we hope to see you um, at Open Day later this year. And certainly, um, if you choose to, to come to ANU, we definitely hope to see you on campus. Um, thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Katie, for your time. Um, and yeah, we'll hopefully see you at the next webinar session next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.